very much, Dawn, um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, it is a thrill to be here and come and meet so many new uh, people. I hope I'll meet some of you afterwards. Um, <coughs> and I wanted just to start by saying St. George's Park's been open barely nine months. Um, actually, officially eight months, if you think of the day that the Duke and Duchess came to open it. So, <coughs> so it's still very early days. But um, at the outset, indeed, even before a, 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 before a, 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 a sod was turfed, uh, we made it very clear to everybody when we came up here that we would play our full part in the community. And I hope that uh, you feel, uh, those who, who have been to St. George's Park, or who've had anything to do with it, feel that we've done that. <coughs> we uh, chose local contractors which in, in Bowman and Kirkland, um, who actually recently won a, an award um, for their job. A remarkable feat, really, um, to build all of that in 72 weeks, which uh, on time and on budget. Um, Turner and Townsend were our project managers. Uh, we created uh, about 300 jobs. Um, 200 of them are new and uh, in the local community, uh, give or take, and of course those who relocated from London and elsewhere hopefully have added to the local economy. Um, we've made um, some great relationships in local partnerships, uh, none, um, none less than uh, important than, uh, or none more important rather than Burton and South Derbyshire. And so our relationship with Dawn, I'm thrilled to come and speak for you Dawn here today. Um, very excited to have played our little part in um, them gaining univer uh, university technical college status and uh, we're looking forward to that uh, and how we, can, um, how we can play our full part. Uh, we've got good relationships, I, I, I hope uh, that everybody feels that with the Staffordshire Borough Council, the Staffordshire County Council, the Chamber of Commerce here <coughs> with uh, local hotels and pubs and uh, we try to make sure we don't compete as far as possible. Obviously, we do compete in certain ways, but um, we, we do encourage people to come here to Branston and to uh, use Hall Cross and other um, local facilities. Indeed, even when we're overbooked at St. George's Park, uh, we actively uh, use uh, local hotel rooms around the area. And in terms of um, <coughs> St. George's Park being seen as elitist, um, it absolutely isn't, and I thought I'd just let you know if you don't know already. We have 32 under 11 teams playing at St George's Park every uh, every weekend. Uh, we have two adult Sunday morning teams playing. We have the Burton ladies team play there. Um, we have 29 mini soccer uh, uh, teams playing there. We have Staffordshire and Derbyshire FA engaging. Um, just to name but a few. So, um, and then of course Burton Albion still train um, and they have that as their training ground. So um, <coughs> we're only sorry that Bradford City stayed at St George's Park. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <coughs> but what I really wanted to talk about today, and I was thinking about how I could make St George's Park relevant um, to local business. And I, I want to share with you a few thoughts about culture <coughs> and performance. And, and, and my sort of mantra is really culture before performance. And um, because St. George's Park is really all about creating uh, cultural change um, for, uh, in the pursuit of high performance. In other words, a winning England. Because we all know that everybody is going to judge St. George's Park ultimately as to whether England wins the World Cup and uh, when we might do that. <coughs> so. But the same principles, in my view, culture before performance, apply uh, in all of our businesses. And so I think the first thing I want to say is that skill these days, for me, is the prerequisite. And so all of you in your different businesses, um, <clears throat> you recruit people for skill, absolutely, and they have to have the skill or the talent to do the job uh, that you want them to do. Um, but there's a very famous quote I've used for many, many years by an American president in the 1920s, Calvin Coolidge. And he said, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. 
genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. Well, let's think about that for a second. How many people can we think of in this room, <clears throat> I mean, not in this room, but those of us in this room think of, um, you know, who've wasted their talents? There'll be people we know who were at school, um, maybe sportsmen and women, um, people who had a tremendous talent for something but somehow didn't you know, really use it or kind of threw it away. Educated derelicts, loads of people who, who have gone to school and become extremely clever and, and followed university and uh, maybe got doctorates and PhDs and goodness knows what, but have not ever really done anything um, with them. So <clears throat> the drivers of success for me our attitude and behavior. And um, that's really what I think we look for and what singles out the people who are successful and the people who aren't. Last night I was at a dinner, Harry Redknapp was asked who was the most uh, brilliant player for him that he ever trained? Who was his favorite player to ever manage in his career? And he said, without a shadow of a doubt, Frank Lampard. And he said, Frank Lampard is not the most gifted footballer that he'd ever met. He's seen many, many, many more gifted players. But from the age of 17, he worked, he worked, and worked, and worked. Very similar stories you will have all heard of David Beckham and other people like that. They made the most of their talents through their work rate and their attitude and their approach. In fact, when I talk to schools, I often put up a, a, a slide and then ask everybody to give me what they think are the qualities of leadership. And um, well, I won't do it with you here today, but it, it's, it's very interesting. And most people come up with words like uh, encouragement, <coughs> role model, flexibility, um, go the extra mile, you know, all, all these words. And they trot all these words out and we write them all up. And then I ask them how many of them are skills and how many are attributes. And they're all attributes. <laughs> so skill is the prerequisite. The thing that singles us all out as to whether we're going to be successful is our, um, is our approach, our attitude. And we do choose our attitude. If we're grumpy in the morning, we've chosen to be grumpy. <laughs> you know. And uh, so we are in control, actually, of our attitude and our approach day in, day out. In exactly the same way as Frank Lampard is in control of his attitude and his approach to training. So the relevance of St George's Park, apart from all the other things that it is, is um, a focus on the role of the coach. Because every good coach for me starts off with uh, looking at their subject by saying, you're a genius. Every single one of you in this room are a genius. And you know, we're not trying to be anybody else, we're just trying to get better at being ourselves. To maximise our talent, to maximise our attributes, to be the very best that we can be at being ourselves. And so culture before performance. What is culture? Culture for me is a vision, understanding where we're trying to go, values, which are absolutely crucial in any decision around culture, discipline, and an, an, an approach to life, I think, that's around lifelong learning. Believing that we can always get better. We were having a conversation at lunch today. Alex Ferguson, he embodies that. He always stood for you know, how every player could be better. Look at Ryan Giggs, those of you who don't all have to love football in here, but Ryan Giggs and the Skulls and these people, they're playing until they're nearly 40 and they still think they can go on improving. And if we think about, <clears throat> so we think about culture and how culture gets in, imbued in, or, in, in us all, it starts at school. Uh, it starts with parents indeed, it starts with family life at home. But, um, so family life, school, um, football teams, Sandhurst, take Sandhurst. I went to Sandhurst and took some of the senior people from the uh, FA there a couple of years ago 
and, um, and, and they explained what they meant by culture before performance. Because we hear about square bashing and we think that that's what, uh, that we think that that's you know, very boring if you're going to the army and you've got to march up and down and so on. What it really is, is drilling into you the disciplines and the culture and the values of the army before they do the rest, which we'll come to in a moment. Louis Gerstner, you know, who uh, it, some of you may know, is the man who turned around IBM. He said, culture is everything. In the end, an organization, that's any of our businesses here, is nothing more than the collective capacity of its people to create value. That's what every business is. If we distill it all down, we talk about our businesses being people, it actually is the culture. So many of us will have wrestled in our lives with, you know, how am I going to turn this management team, this disparate, maybe even dysfunctional team, if I've come into a new business or maybe you bought a new business or you moved to a new company, how are you going to turn them into an effective management, production, marketing, sales team, whatever they are? And in my book, it will always be by establishing the culture. And so many people make a mistake by bypassing that. And they leave that aside and come in and just think that they can somehow turn the switch on and everything will work. In other sports, Andy Flower, I haven't heard what's happening in the test match today. Um, the Aussies, many years before, they did it. They've now lost it, thank goodness. Stuart Lancaster. <laughs> after the New Zealand nonsense with the England rugby team, what he's done with England rugby, Roy Hodgson, Alex Ferguson. There's an interesting little experiment going on in the northeast at the moment for football lovers. A certain Paolo Di Canio is trying to establish his culture at Sunderland. It'll be very interesting whether it works. It's certainly going to be shock treatment, but I applaud him. He's trying to establish the culture. And there will be some pain in doing it. I think shared vision is the other thing that's so important in terms of being able to lead the whole person. My brother, when uh, we were much younger, we were in the food business together, he used to say to me, David, uh, have we got enough money to employ another couple of poes? I said, what are poes, Rick? And he said, pairs of hands. <laughs> and what he meant, he didn't care, he just wanted two more people who could, who could hump pallets or you know, whatever it was going to be, and a lot of heavy lifting work. But nowadays, we know that leading people is leading the whole person. It's not only leading um, the Poe, as it were, whatever those, that person can do, his skill or her skill, it's also leading that person's mind. It's being interested in involving them in how the company develops. It's leading their heart, their spirit, the camaraderie. What makes you get up in the morning? What makes you want to come to work and be part of that particular business? And the successful businesses lead the whole person. I commend to you a book by Stephen Covey. You will have all read The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, but you may not have read The Eighth Habit. And The Eighth Habit is the second book, and it is all about that. It is leading the whole person. So, 80% <clears throat> Uh, of the time, I would say, should be devoted towards getting the culture right. Um, culture drives personal motivation and it drives our behaviours. The teacher has the defining influence and it's the teacher who really can encourage people to take ownership of their own career. So in English football, St George's Park is about changing the culture. It's about encouraging people to want to be world-class for themselves. When we went to Sandhurst recently, the colonel said to the assembled gathering and said to me, David, can I speak candidly? I said, sure. He said, um, what, what are you hoping to gain from coming to see us? I said, well, we're, I don't know anybody who turns um, young people comparatively spotty, <laughs> undisciplined young men and women into very effective leaders in the shorter space of time than you do. And he said, well, my view is there's something sport needs to learn, and in particular football needs to learn. 
And that is that leadership is not taught, it's learnt. And the relevance of what I was saying about Sandhurst in the, in the square bashing is that that's putting the culture first. And how they learn to be leaders is through experience. And after doing the vision and the values and the discipline, the rest of the time in army training, or the same thing in Marines and Air Force and anywhere else you go in, in, in the military, it's all experiential. So time and time and time again, you're given a chance to learn, to maybe succeed, maybe fail, but you learn how to be a leader. And that's absolutely fundamental. Absolutely fundamental. Personal leadership, for me, results. Because once you've had the opportunity to experience it, uh, you begin to want to take ownership and take responsibility. So at St George's Park, for example, before we even built a brick, we had to agree what our values were. And they were accessible, aspirational, so we wanted it to be open to everybody. We wanted it to be somewhere people would aspire to come to. We wanted it to be stimulating. We wanted it to be rewarding so that when you left, you felt that you'd learned something rather like you go to a speech or a lecture, <clears throat> and even if you got one thing out of it, you'd say to you, you and your friends afterwards, you know, that was really worth it. So what a performance then, if we've invested in getting the culture right. For me, performance has three words, leadership, responsibility, and attitude. Defining leadership is always an interesting one, and I've picked out two or three for you. <clears throat> Shakespeare said leadership is all about being a student of human nature. Think about it, it's very profound. Montgomery, leadership is the capacity and will to rally men and women to a common purpose which will inspire confidence. Good, okay? Sort of does it for me. But the one that really does it for me is Eisenhower. And I think this absolutely hits it on the mark. Leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because he wants to do it. And that's the point. The point is that we're encouraging personal leadership. So great leaders encourage other people to then lead themselves and lead their colleagues. And we can coach leaders. We do coach leaders. We coach leaders in military establishments. We coach leaders in business schools. We coach leaders at Burton and South Derbyshire College. We coach leaders through MBAs, we coach leaders in sports medicine and sports science. We push boundaries, we encourage innovation. So we actually can coach leaders. Responsibility, I'll do very quickly, but for responsibility I leave people whenever we do, again, school talks particularly, with two little pieces of my toolkit. Responsibility is the three R's. Responsibility for your own performance, responsibility for your own development, and responsibility for your teammates. And I find they really work. And that again is the culture that we're trying to engender in St George's Park. And the attitude, I call it my personal app. Ambition, passion, and perseverance. Persistence, if you like, perseverance. Ambition, passion, and perseverance. So there are many, many lessons in sport for business. And uh, the mistakes in business, I think, are usually brought about by people forgetting the power of the dressing room. And when I talk about the power of the dressing room, I mean the power of the people that we employ. Jim Magilton, who was my manager at Ipswich, he always used to say, when a team got it right, the dressing room was running the club. Now, there might be some extremes of that. I think Chelsea last year, when they took over the running of the club, for those of you who are football fans in the room. But it's interesting thinking about it. That's the dynamic. Think about really successful companies, and I'm sure there are, all of you in this room are being successful, I hope, in one way or another. It's because you're working together as a team. And it's not all top-down. 
I listened to a lecture the other day with uh, Stuart Lancaster, who's making such a great job of the England rugby team. And he, he gave a little short list of some of the reasons where companies fail. His first one was the ones who employ consultants. <laughs> and I'm sorry if there are any consultants in here. <laughs> but too often, it's too easy, of course there's a role for consultants at times, but it is sometimes too easy to you know, abrogate one's own leadership responsibilities and one's own team building for your own business and call out for other people to do it for you. To have too few coaches um, and not to build the team spirit in the business. Not enough involvement with everybody, not enough integration, not enough consulting, not enough listening. Arrogant management. Communication only being top down, not having enough communication coming up. You know, the really successful managers, Alex Ferguson, Arsene Wenger et al., they listen to their players and listen to their coaches. And they have a two-way communication and it works. Employing skill without recognizing the person. I know and we were having a discussion at lunch today. There are some successful managers who just go out and buy the player. And Harry Redknapp might be one of them. Uh, I can think of a number of others uh, in the game over the years. Mark Hughes, there are a number of people. They just go out and throw the checkbook, and some of them are very good at assembling a team. But it's never going to be anything that lasts, because it's just about buying skills, and it's not actually about developing and honing um, the, cohes the cohesiveness uh, of a team. People who focus on weaknesses before strengths, and the people who fail to invest in youth and learning. So St George's Park's vision is to win the World Cup in the 2020s. But much more importantly, it's to develop a new generation of coaches. And a new generation of coaches who in turn can inspire the young men and women we want to succeed as players in the future. And to encourage those players to be personal leaders. Often when I talk about leadership, some people look around the room and think, well, I'm not talking about them. I am, I'm talking about every single person in the room because every single one of us in this room is a leader of ourselves. We are personally responsible. And for the last 20 years, we've had a culture, in certainly in too much in football, of spoon-feeding our players, making it all too easy, and then throwing money at them. And then we wonder why nobody takes responsibility. Nobody takes, it's always somebody else's fault. Well, there's no room for that anymore. You look at the Germans, you look at the Spanish, you look at the... You know, we've been overtaken by our European neighbours. They're not blaming anybody else, they've got on with it. <laughs> and they've improved. And so, this me message of personal leadership, personal ownership, and commitment to going on improving day after day. In athletics, everything is about being a personal best. What's your PB, the coach will always say? What's your personal best? And if you're not doing a, per you know, their definition of winning is not always coming first, it's whether you've got a personal best. As Ian Thorpe, of one of us, uh, if you've been in the hydrotherapy pool, there are so many quotes we've got around there, but one of them is, um, you know, winning, sorry, losing is not coming second. It's getting out of the pool knowing that you could have done better. So, it's a very exciting time, and um, we are going to see, hopefully, the benefits of it in years to come. And uh, I would encourage you very much to Think of it in your own business. Think, have you got the culture right? Have you got, you know, have we really invested enough time in getting the culture right? Because then, I'm convinced, every single business can fly. I'll leave you with a couple of thoughts. Somebody said to me the other day, um, bless you, David, um, do you know, if we assume that most of us, if we're lucky, have a lifespan of 80 years, plus or minus, 80 years is 4,000 weeks. So I'm not going to ask any of you where you are in that patch, but I'm, I'm at 3,000 weeks. So I've got 1,000 weeks left, hopefully. And it does concentrate the mind, because we're all going to have a rocking chair moment one day, and we'll be in that rocking chair thinking, I wish we could have, or I would have. And we mustn't do that. 
We must grasp every opportunity we've got today to have fun, enjoy life, contribute, build our culture, excel in performance, and uh, all together enjoy our lives. So get the culture right before the performance. It's been great speaking to you. And before I finish, a little plug for your community foundation in Staffordshire. I don't know how many of you, hands up, who knows about the community foundation in Staffordshire? It proves my point. There's only two fingers went up, that wasn't a hand, it was two fingers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've just become chairman of the UK Community Foundations, and there are 54 community foundations in, um, in the United Kingdom, 51 of them in England. I was chairman of Suffolk for eight years, and um, they're the best things uh, in charity for me. Uh, charity is very personal, you only ever support charity. Um, it's either very personal to you, or it's a, it's a pulling your heartstrings, or maybe it's a sense of duty. A few people maybe support charity because they want to be recognized for doing it. Um, <clears throat> but the community foundations support all the charities that are under the radar. And I can't tell you in Staffordshire, I must find out, and I will, I've only taken on this job two weeks ago. But in Suffolk, if I tell you, in my county, there are four and a half thousand charities in that county alone. And that, that is replicated all over the country. And those four and a half thousand charities, when we ask people what they've heard of, they say the hospice, the air ambulance, fantastic. Children's Hospice, all marvellous. But there are a whole raft of others that are dealing with domestic violence, sexual abuse, drugs, disabled sports, stroke victims, mental illness, uh, you, you name it. Everything you can possibly imagine. And they're operating in our towns and villages all over this county and all over the counties in every, every part of the country. And they are often run by volunteers. In fact, they are mostly run by volunteers. They don't have big, sophisticated fundraising like the hospices and, uh, and air ambulances do, and somebody has to support them because they are part of the fabric of the county. This county, Suffolk, Derbyshire, all over the country, they're doing extraordinary things. So if you get any chance to, when you go home, Google Staffordshire or Derbyshire uh, Community Foundation, and um, it won't be the last you hear of it from me either. But uh, they're very special and they are worth getting involved with. And uh, it's a great way of being able to support our messages, support all charities. But what about supporting a little bit in your own backyard? Making life better for those who aren't as fortunate as us, or those who are our customers, or those of us who are our uh, suppliers, uh, or indeed those of us who employ large numbers of people. We will all have people or relatives in need in the six degrees of separation, everybody knows somebody. So it's a great opportunity to support your local, uh, your local causes. On that note, sorry for the little uh, soapbox moment, but it's been great to speak to you, and don't forget, culture before performance. again to our, uh, our sponsor Henry here and uh, for the, uh, uh, the, the, the plug he's given for uh, helping business to save money and energy and uh, thanks very much David for speaking because there's quite a few uh, good points that came out there which I'm sure we can all use in our businesses and uh, finally before we go I've got a small presentation to do. Come on then. <laughs> These are for you, Dawn, for yeah, uh, myself and uh, Chamber Council. Okay.